I am, as many of you know, Lyndon LaRouche, and I have the pleasure, uh, the unique experience, of playing television host to my wife, Helga. Uh, this is a rather unusual experience for me, so if I stumble a bit here and there, don't be, surpri don't be surprised. Um, oh, well. well. Uh, Helga's in the United States now in, uh, under the circumstances of observing what's going on in Europe and the United States simultaneously. And I think she can probably best tell you, I can intervene here and there, but uh, I, she can best tell you what she thinks her role is here at this, in this performance. Well, I mean, the situation has erupted now, which I predicted would erupt. It had to erupt, and that is the end of the euro system is coming very near. Uh, today there is an emergency finance minister meeting of the EO EU where Timothy Geithner is uh, attending or has been attending and he made a proposal to use the term asset-backed security, uh, finance security model, the TALF, uh, to <clears throat> leverage the European uh, stability fund, um, or rather the European Financial Stability Facility, to leverage that by a factor of 10. Um, now that would mean uh, basically that the present uh, 440 billion uh, euro which are in this fund would be basically um, become 4 trillion euro. Uh, and that is the pressure to keep somehow the European banking system uh, flowed. Now this was, as far as I heard from initial reports, rejected by the European finance ministers. Well, there are good reasons. First of all, everybody knows this would be pure hyperinflation. This would mean, uh, you know, for all of Europe and the United States, what happened in Germany in 1923, hyperinflation in a very short period of time. And there are many, many obstacles uh, why this would not function. I mean, first of all, there is the question of legality. Uh, a big question is, would the European Financial Stability Facility have the right to do that? Because after all, it's supposed to be you know, an organization which is constituted by the different European member states of the EU. And naturally, the European Central Bank would have to play a big role in this and you know that would be a clear violation of their own statute which after all uh, has only one function uh, or rather the bank has only one function which is the stability of the currency. Now that has become a laughing stock ever since the EZB has turned into the biggest bad bank in the world by buying up uh, toxic uh, state bonds from all kinds of bankrupt uh, members of the EU, uh, European Union uh, <clears throat> and uh, therefore it is not going to be uh, easily swallowed be be because especially if you remember that just uh, about a good week ago the chief economist of the European Central Bank Jürgen Stark resigned out of protest against this EZB buying of toxic state bonds and that has already caused a complete uh, earthquake because, you know, if you remember, uh, the previous president of Germany, Horst Köhler, had resigned already in May uh, last year out of protest against the first bailout package against, uh, for Greece. Then a couple of months ago, um, the <clears throat> head of the Bundesbank, Axel Weber, who was supposed to be the designated uh, successor of the present head of the EZB, Trichet, also resigned out of protest against this uh, hyperinflationary policy. And there is a whole group of traditionalist bankers, uh, like, for example, the first chief economist, Ottmar Issing, the present head of the Bundesbank, Jens Weidmann, who all have come out against these policies. And I think that this will not function. And there is right now a growing revolt in the uh, coalition parties, in the Free Democrats, uh, the, uh, one of the uh, uh, parliamentarians there, Frank Scheffler, is uh, organizing an internal vote um, and there is a majority of the liberal members uh, against it. There is growing opposition in the CDU, in the CSU 
and Mrs. Merkel could be out of office uh, before the end of the month if uh, things continue this way. And therefore, I think uh, this whole thing is uh, a dead-born uh, baby, especially because now uh, the rush vote, which was supposed to occur on the 29th of September, uh, to basically agree on the second bailout package for Greece, has now been postponed till October. Um, and generally, it is said that, therefore, it will not be voted until 2012. Now, with the tempo with which things are going right now, I mean, this is the end of the euro system, and that is a good thing. Well, in this circumstance, what about the uh, question of Russia and China? We now have a situation in which Russia is moving toward uh, China closely. They tend to agree. There was a very uh, honorific sort of uh, acceptance of uh, Putin's presence. He ostensibly is going to be the president-elect of Russia in the next term. No. Uh, his policies are those I find extremely interesting myself. I think that the Russia-China-United States prospect, if this current president of the United States is removed for good cause, there are two particularly good causes, he's violated the Constitution in ways which could mean his ouster properly. He also is a mental case and therefore could be relieved under the 25th Amendment of that position. Uh, the, the question, I think, in my mind, when you're talking about this, from your position as a leader in German politics uh, is that we are now faced a situation which Western Europe and Central Europe have no sovereignty whatsoever left in, their, in the mainland territory. And therefore, we, my view is that the United States, without Obama, could very easily come to an agreement, under desperation actually, with Russia and China to start some kind of cooperation now which would open the gates for a general reorganization of the inter uh, bankrupt international financial system now? Well, um, you know, the, the whole euro um, was sold to the public in Europe with the argument, you know, that it would lead to eternal peace and prevent future wars from occurring. But if you look at the tensions which have now erupted between the Greek population and how they look at the EU bureaucracy or how they look at the German government. I mean, this euro has caused more disunity than anything else you can imagine. And therefore, the return of Germany to its sovereign control over its own currency, meaning a new DMARC, um, is actually the only hope. Now, the argument that uh, if Germany would go back to its own sovereign currency, uh, that this would hurt the German export because the new currency would be immediately upvalued. This is a completely fraudulent argument because the German export is valued not because uh, you know it's uh, competitive in price, but because the German Mittelstand, middle-level middle industry has a unique uh, position in the world economy because they ha have high-quality products which are wanted in the entire world. So even if the prices would go up relatively a little bit, it would not mean that the desire for these pro products would not be there. And therefore, if you look at the um, uh, situation in respect to what are the prospects for Germany, I mean, with a collapsing uh, European um, monetary union where ger the German taxpayer would be the milk cow uh, for all of these failed uh, programs, uh, you know, this, this is no perspective. On the other side, if Germany would ally with Russia, with China, with the whole development perspective for the development of the Far East, which is now high on the agenda, then the German economy would fit perfectly with the specific, uh, <coughs> uh, you know, product uh, 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 volume and, 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 you know, quality of volume uh, of product, it would be perfect for being integrated with the development of Eurasia. As you know, we have been pushing for the building of the Eurasian land bridge since the collapse of the Soviet Union in uh, 1991. And uh, Germany would 
just totally profit from realigning, uh, being part of an alliance of sovereign nations for you know the development of the world. Well, what we have here, you know, I think Helga, in the United States, is the following pr prospect: this president is going to go soon. I would say, I would hope within a week or two or something like that. He has a mental problem which may require attention by prop proper officials. Uh, he also is not liked anymore in the United States. As a matter of fact, most of the citizens are, who were formerly Democrats and Republicans are shunning anything to do with the Democratic Republican Party generally today because of the disgust with Obama. His conditions uh, have made conditions impossible inside the United States. But the, partic uh, the uh, prospect is we have uh, coming out of the North Pole area, we get into three areas which are crucial for this planet as a whole. Uh, and you just sort of out of the North Pole. And this includes Russia, uh, Canada as well as the United States, uh, and, and China. These three countries represent the pillars of any general recovery of the world. They would not be the exclusive of ours, but the three coming together would create the circumstance which India would come in, obviously, other nations would come in at, at their own choice. This, this is what I see now is the immediate prospect, and even in this uh, closing qu quarter of uh, this year, that there could be very soon an agreement among China, Russia, and without Obama, the United States, who would take the lead in bringing other nations together around a common, common principle. This is what I see as the only possible chance for the United States and for Europe now. Germany fits in perfectly. Germany fits with China perfectly. It's, it's a real potential there. But uh, this, I think, is what the option is right now. Well, I, I look at it also in, in one other as, uh, respect, and that is that, you know, in 1989, when the Berlin Wall came down, um, I mean, that was what we called in Germany a historical chance, like it only happens maybe once in a century, because all of a sudden, you know, there was no more enemy. The Warsaw Pact dissolved rather relatively peacefully. And at that time, you had the possibility to make a completely new world order for the 21st century. Uh, you stepped in with your proposals, and I collaborated with you on that. First, the, we called it the productive triangle, which was the idea to take the region from Paris, Berlin, Vienna as one integrated economic region upgraded through high technology, maglev trains, high temperature reactor, other uh, avant-garde technologies. And then, you know, basically when, when uh, <clears throat> the Soviet Union uh, dissolved in 91, we extended it immediately to become the Eurasian land bridge, which was the idea to integrate the infrastructure of Europe uh, and you know to integrate the population dense and highly industrial areas of Europe with those of Asia, and uh, that was a vision um, which could have changed the whole face of the planet because it would have meant that all the previous you know conflicts and and territorial claims and proxy wars and using third world countries for proxy uh, wars would have ended. And you could have used the science driver effect of such a program to also end the underdevelopment of the developing countries. And if that would have, would have been done, you know, Africa would today be a blooming garden with new cities because you could have had a gigantic technology transfer uh, to those underdeveloped regions of the world. And you know, that was a historic moment like, which I think really only lasted uh, realistically from, from November 89 to may, maybe March, uh, May 1990, because then the geostrategic decisions to prevent this from happening uh, on the initiative of Margaret Thatcher, who was an evil uh, spinster, <laughs> but she had a vicious campaign against Germany at that time, but also Mitterrand, who demanded that the euro uh, should be the price for the German unification. 
and also Bush Senior, they prevented this from happening. And they answered uh, instead with this idea of the new special relationship between uh, Great Britain and the United States based on the idea of running the world as an empire. And, uh, you know, if you, if you study this period, you know, and see how a historical chance was missed, uh, I have said in many, many speeches at that time um, that if one would make the mistake to superimpose on the bankrupt communist economy the equally bankrupt free market system, um, then you, maybe you could extract profit for, you know, a couple of years, uh, but then eventually you would come to a collapse much worse than even that of the collapse of communism. And that's exactly the point where we are at. And uh, I can only say, you know, I mean, politicians and other, you know, decision makers should, you know, really study this, that, you know, you don't have such historical chances all the time. And I look at the present collapse of the euro system as one of these other possibilities where out of a collapse of a system which should end because it's an immoral system, you have the chance to make something much better for the future. Well, you've got an interesting situation. Now, here you are today. We're sitting here Friday in anticipation of some elections and other developments in Europe, particularly the Berlin election, mayoral election, things like that, going on now. And uh, here we're coming to a, a crucial point where things are about ready to break apart that so far the Obama administration has not succeeded in pulling together the kind of juggernaut that it intends to have for this weekend to take over. Uh, the Obama is extremely unpopular in the United States now, and that's going to be more clearly perceived as the days go, and the hours go by, actually, uh, uh, in the United States. So we're in a point where the United States is on the verge of collapse. Europe, from the Atlantic to the Urals, practically, is, is in a terrible condition. And I, what is required from the United States now, a new initiative, presuming that we throw this president who is totally disqualified out, it can be for violations of the, his constitutional responsibilities or simply mental incompetence, we're thrown out. And under those conditions, I think the United States will make a different kind of turn especially toward Europe and toward Asia. We understand the importance of China as a fulcrum for developing Asia. We understand that the revival of Russia uh, from the circumstances it's been through as a cooperative partner of China and of, say, Germany, the United States, and so forth. This is the way to go. This is the way we have to go. So I, thought, I think that maybe we've entered into a very interesting new period of Humanity. I would definitely think so because, you know, the, uh, the only way how you can solve this totally bankrupt financial system is through Glass-Steagall. Um, and the motion in the United States for Glass-Steagall is very strong. Um, I don't know if it's yet strong enough, but it, there is a lot of recognition that only a return to the policies of FDR uh, the PECORA Commission, the New Deal, uh, large infrastructure projects like the TVA, but especially as a first step, Class Deagle, uh, must be done. Now, we have been campaigning in Europe also to have in every European country, in Italy, France, Germany, the Scandinavian countries, also people coming out to discuss the separation of the banks. and. Um, uh, there is a good news, and that is that the new elected prime minister of Denmark, um, who is a social democrat, in a recent uh, press conference uh, told our correspondent, Michelle Rasmussen, uh, when she asked, will you support uh, the separation of the banks and stronger uh, re-regulation, um, uh, she came actually out uh, saying that she would introduce Klaas Stiegel. So Denmark is just a small country, but it has the advantage of not being in the euro. They still have their Danish crown. And uh, under such crisis conditions, I think even small countries can have a world historical uh, role uh, by acting boldly on what they know has to be done. And I'm absolutely sure that if the United States would in the next period come out with Klaas Deagle, 
um, then, you know, all the different people in Europe who already think, you know, that they would like to have that, but as long as the, you know, dictatorship of the EU structure sits on top of them, you know, they cannot really do it. Uh, but in that case, you could have a dynamic to have a reorganization of the world financial system in a relatively short period of time. And to all the people who say this would be catastrophic, this would be terrible, well, I can assure you it would be the opposite. It would be the sure way to risk recovery. And after all, there was a study made in the um, uh, <clears throat> Bundeswehr, in the Army University in Hamburg more than a year ago, uh, calculating what would it take to, for Germany to go back to the D mark. Uh, and they came to the conclusion it would be relatively easy. It would be much easier than the move from the D mark to the euro. And uh, it would be costly, but by far not as costly as the continuation of the bailout policies, which would wipe out the life savings of everybody because hyperinflation you know, is just the most costly thing you can have. So I'm, you know, moderately optimistic that there is a chance that we may use this opportunity to, you know, go to a better world. Maybe I should affirm my particular outlook on that, Helga. Uh, first of all, that the whole system is coming down. We are in, already in a hyperinflationary takeoff process around the transatlantic region. And if it's not stopped, if this... Uh, Geithner operation, similar kinds of operations are not stopped. If the British is not, are not stopped, the whole world is going into a dark age. Now, on the British side, as you know, the, there's an intention to bring on the dark age. The intention to reduce the world's population from the order of seven billion people to, to, to less than one. Now, that is genocide, and that's being broadcast by the British royal family itself. Now, it's their policy. That's the practice under this president we have in the United States, shall we say, an outgoing fellow, and we hope that's very soon. Uh, so under these conditions, we are entering a completely new period of history. Mm. We must restore the nation state, otherwise you cannot have an economic recover, recovery. We have a cooperation coming together closely with Russia and China. My intention is that the United States shall be the third partner with these two because of our relationship to the Arctic system, the Arctic economic system. And that will bring other nations like India and others immediately into coming in together with the same thing. By going to a new system now, and we have to go to one or our hell is going to break loose, we have the chance of bringing back Europe because people fail to realize, as what you know, there is no sovereignty of any nation in Western and Central Europe. It's been taken away. These are being treated as colonies of the British Empire, and they're being raped and looted on that basis. So the only chance now is to make a new turn in this direction, and that's my view of the thing. Well, I think that for Germany it's a question of existence because, you know, Germany, like Japan, um, is a country which has almost no raw materials and nevertheless was able to develop a very high living standard with an extremely good social system, entirely based on both the Bismarck reforms, uh, which after all turned Germany from a feudal country into an industrial country, uh, basically based on the American system of economy. Um, you know, I worked on this a while ago, and it's quite fascinating that Bismarck was a true a follower of the uh, Carey, Henry Carey uh, American system uh, by basically, you know, both going for uh, tariffs, for protectionism, uh, for a high emphasis on science and technology. And, you know, therefore Germany was able to compensate for the lack of raw materials. But na naturally now, um, you know, you know, Germany is on the way to crash. I mean, if Germany remains in the euro, plus, you know, it has the, uh, to face the effect of the absolutely criminal energy change, you know, the sudden exit from nuclear energy, which uh, the Merkel government uh, <coughs> pushed through after the uh, developments in Fukushima, uh, there will be serious blackouts 
come this winter, if the winter is going to be anywhere, you know, normal, cold or, or colder, you will have see, you will see days and days uh, of blackouts with unforeseeable social consequences on top of the euro crisis. Uh, so, you know, Germany needs in the same way like the United States, a complete science driver lifting, you know, of the productivity of the economy uh, upwards. And that can only be done through the kind of uh, new Bretton Woods system you have been talking about for a long time. And uh, even if this means a complete change in thinking, you know, away from monetarist profits, from you know, short-term uh, calculations to a more fundamental idea what a credit system would mean. It is totally in the German interest uh, to enter such long-term cooperation treaties with Russia, with China, with the other Asian countries, because, you know, the economic potential of the Far East, you know, is simply what the whole world needs, and Germany would be absolutely one of the prime uh, countries to, to cooperate in this. And then in particular we have the situation of the effect of economic policy on social policy. Now you have the, with Schellenhuber and people like that and the British royal family which is explicit on that. The British royal family is now committed to reduce the world's population soon and rapidly from about seven billion people to less than one. That's their stated policy. That is also the policy of President Obama in the United States and similar kinds of situations around the world of this type. This would probably mean more than a dark age because we're going into weather conditions in the galaxy now, which mankind as a species have never been exposed to, but it's inevitable we're going to be exposed to them now because we're on that galactic cycle which, where this is going to occur. Only with technological progress, very high technological process, can we defend the human species on this planet against the kind of weather conditions which are coming in our direction now. It's always already becoming this year much more severe. Harsh weather conditions which are a result of actually galactically driven conditions. And so therefore the human race's existence depends upon ending the green policy entirely because any nation that's going for a green policy is going to commit genocide against its own population. And the fact that the British royal family came out publicly to mm -hmm. em emphasize its support for a policy of genocide against their own people and against the people of other nations indicates that the policies which have been running Europe mm -hmm. and running a good deal of the United States in this recent period must be e extinguished permanently for the sake of the safety of the human species it itself. Well, I think this absolutely scandalous movie, uh, or rather video report from a conference which took place in March in the Royal Society of Arts, uh, I think in London, under the chairmanship of Prince Philip, where Sir David Attenberg made this absolutely unbelievable call for a reduction of population to save some supposed extinct species. Uh, I mean, I have not seen such such a brutal call for population reduction uh, since 70 years, and you know what I'm referring to. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I think that the whole idea of the anthropogenic climate uh, change is such a lie, you know, and that is the whole basis for the green policy. I mean, if you look at the entire basis for the energy shift in Germany, uh, it is the idea that, you know, Schellenhuber made this uh, really insane proposal to have the decarbonization quote of the world economy, which means he doesn't want to only get rid of nuclear energy, but oil, gas, uh, and uh, coal. And uh, naturally, with the so-called decarbonization of the world economy, the world population uh, capacity would be not more than one or two billion. And that has been the basis for the German government decision to exit nuclear energy. Now, I had some discussions here uh, with politicians in the United States who said that cannot be true. It cannot be true that the German government would actually do this. And I told them, no, no it's very serious. 
and it's, it does not make any sense, it's not reasonable. And you know, the only people who profit from this uh, going to the entirely renewable energies are the hedge funds. And the hedge funds are sitting mostly in London. And if you look at the boards of the hedge funds, well, there are many lords and, and, and other such uh, creatures uh, uh, the management in the management. And it's a complete swindle. Now, I'm campaigning in Germany that this should be stopped. I think there is a counter revolt because, you know, people realize that they have been had, that the whole basis for the uh, green uh, energy access, uh, ex exit is, uh, is uh, you know, basically a swindle. And uh, it, should, it should end. You know, I have a totally vision what Germany should do. Um, you know, I mean, for Europe to survive, it's a moral question to develop Africa. I mean, you all have seen in the media these horrendous pictures of 20 million people about to die in, in East Africa alone. And then you can count probably another, you know, millions in, in Niger, in Mali, in many other uh, countries. The whole continent is being torn apart by civil war, tension, and uh, you know, ethnic uh, problems which are steered, steered from the outside. And I think what we have to do instead of building this ridiculous desert tech, uh, solar panels in the Sahara, uh, what we have to do is we have to basically redirect um, the whole question of the Eurasian land bridge and the world land bridge uh, and direct it into the development of Africa. I think that if there would be the political will where a coalition of sovereign European nations would adopt as a mission to develop Africa uh, in terms of existing technologies. I mean, this would not require any new breakthroughs or discoveries, just build in infrastructure, ports, roads, railways. You could end hunger in half a year. You could end the super serious poverty as it is now in maybe five years. And in one or two generations, you could have decent living conditions for every person in Africa. And I'm convinced that that is the test if Europe is going to survive as a moral, you know, as a moral uh, test for, for its, its own existence. And I'm committed that this becomes the reality, that out of this crisis, we are going to build a completely new planet. I mean, in a certain sense, what, what we are looking at is the old question of the new Federalist Papers. You know, what Alexander Hamilton was discussing with others, is mankind able to govern itself? And I think this is now not a question only for America, as it was then discussed, but it's the question for the planet. Can we give ourselves an order, you know, in which the happiness and pursuit of happiness of all human beings on this planet uh, can be guaranteed. And I think it's high time that we end the misery of wars, of solving political conflicts through wars, but that we basically you know, adjust the political and economic order with the laws of the universe. And um, then if we do that, then we fulfill also the old vision of my friend and your friend, Nicolaus of Cusa, <laughs> uh, who thought that in any case, you know, that the only way how concordance in the earth could uh, be established, that if you go for the development of all people on this planet. I think, I think you've said it. <laughs> well, Helga, it's good to have you on this, this media. I hope the, our audience here will enjoy, enjoy what we're, you're doing for them <laughs> right now. Well, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> I'm happy to have you here, too. Of course.